We are live. This is Hack and Grow Rich. I am your co-host, your co-pilot to this incredible show, and Shaheen Cheyenne is my uh, wingman. And we're going to talk about some pretty interesting stuff tonight about starting companies, give you some updates in our own personal lives as well as Amazon updates. I mean, if you're a marketing guy, if you own a company, if you want some hacks to live longer, be stronger, and be a bigger man, this is the show for you. Am I wrong? I think you are very correct, sir. <laughs> I, I think we have a lot of interesting information in today's show. You know, Bart and I do this show weekly, and we're always excited to talk and to see where we can bring value to you based on our 30 plus years each, at least in business and success. And Bart, you know, my, my book just launched. We're, we're doing a soft launch now, so we're not putting out any press releases. It's going very quiet for the first week. It's kind of different than what most people do. And then we're going to go to a release party and a hard launch, and I'm going to be doing press for it. But I've done about 80 or 90 podcasts at this point, podcast interviews and shows. And my plan is to do about 150 by the end of the year. So I'm pretty excited about that for anybody who is interested in my book and my story, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. It is out now on Amazon. So look for it on the show notes. We will include in the show notes where you can get it or just go to Amazon and put in Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. Not to be confused with the TV show Billions with Daniel Lewis, which is now on a new season, I think on Showtime, and it's fucking spectacular. Re really one of the best shows on TV. Have you seen that part at all? I have seen one episode, and I thought, okay, do I have time for this because it's so good? You know, so it gets you pulled in. And by the way, for those of you, if you're a fan of the podcast, buy the book. I haven't read it yet. I've listened to the first episode and I'm so excited. And yet I've only heard a small percent of your, of your stories from back then. Yeah. And every time you tell them, I'm just on the edge of my seat because the story and this ride of when you're 18 and 19 and 20 years old is so incredible. It feels like a movie and I can't believe I get the joy of sitting here with the actual dude. Like you're the Leonardo DiCaprio of your own story. <laughs> Thanks, brother. That's funny. So this picture that's actually taken here by David LaChapelle, if you guys, I'm showing a picture of my book cover, was taken by David LaChapelle, who just before me, he shot this, he shot Leo DiCaprio in his studio. So it's a, it's a very interesting time in the 90s where I think we were both up and coming. Um, so that was very exciting. I think, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. Um, having 15 minutes of fame now that you bring it up, you know, I, I obviously, you know, had a limited run of fame, but it is a, it is a very, I would say elusive thing because walking into a room and you probably know this because I know you are famous in other countries for your handwriting analysis. And when you walk in and people recognize you and people notice you and they're fans of your work and what you've done, it's very easy to let that go to your ego. And I think it's, it's very easy to let that change you. But then there's other people who I think we both know who are able to carry humility forward and have the discipline to to not let that get to their head. And I think that's always really interesting thing for me to watch. Yeah, I was talking to somebody who said, well, you're famous, aren't you? And this woman who's from another country, I said, no, no, you don't understand. Like we live in LA. Fame is like Oscar, paparazzi, like the rest of us just nod each other at Trader Joe's and it's like, oh, I just saw a new movie with you. So there's this level of fame within like the 30 mile zone that doesn't happen elsewhere. Um, but, you know, before the internet, when I was doing two or three radio shows a day, I mean, I was a recognizable guy because I was on CNN, I was on the morning shows, I was on the, you know, I was on the, we hosted a radio show. So, I mean, there were that moment back before the internet when the only way that you're really famous is if you came through the tube on TV. Or you yeah. heard it on the radio. Like if you were on the morning radio show and, and radio was so different back there, like every market had one guy or, or one guy and girl that if they endorsed you, you were you were automatically, you know, anointed by the king. And now there's, you know, ever less syndication. There's only a few markets like the Howard Stearns of the world, which I've been on twice. So yeah, I had a little bit of taste of it. The difference between you and me is that you had a little bit of fame and a whole bunch of money. 
<laughs> bags and bags of money. Yeah. Literally. And yeah. I had fame and significance and didn't have bags of money. And I went, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to make money next decade. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lower the significance and increase the security and value on my value chain. It's funny that you mentioned that. It's like, I think about like when, when we talk about um, rating people's looks, um, it's like an LA 10 versus like a Midwest 10. <laughs> it's very different. You know, you're in LA and it's like, every two seconds it's like you, you become immune like absolutely gorgeous people become relatively meaningless because there's so many of them and then you go to you know somewhere like illinois or you know the midwest and like all of a sudden you see one person that would be an la5 and you're like oh my god <laughs> well I, I found especially if you're in hollywood or past you know right around the entertainment because all the best looking women and men by the way for, you know like the brad pitts of the world they're the top of their class they're the models of the little town they all feel unstoppable and they're like i'm gonna go to la and be a star and so you got all these beautiful people getting off the bus realizing that okay i'm a i'm a solid seven here <laughs> like this oh, yeah. is gonna be hard <laughs> Well, you must have noticed that from when you go to castings. I, I have lots of friends that are casting directors and in the industry, and they'll put a post up for something like that. Like Brad Pitt meets Leo DiCaprio looking person. And all these people you think like they would be unique on their own. And then you see a line of them around the corner to audition for this film. And you're like, yeah, no, there's like, there's like a thousand like you you are not a fucking snowflake you know well it's funny and and we won't talk about acting too long but you know the better looking you are in hollywood i think your chances go down of ever being a big star oh. um i had a really good friend who was just a fabulous actress ever since she was 18 or 19 went to college together and she worked at it for a good seven years and she goes bart i am just the best friend good looking she goes mm -hmm. and i'm almost too hot because if i'm next to the star I'm almost as pretty as her. So they pick a girl that's like six. And so she literally was almost good looking to be the lead, but not quite yet. She was too good looking to be the fat chubby girl. And so it's really yeah. weird. Like that character actors almost have a better shot unless right. you are literally like that 10 or that, you know, really, and take every talented. Don't get me wrong. You have to be remarkably talented because the Megan Foxes and the people that aren't remarkably talented wash out pretty quickly when you cut to like the hard stuff. Yeah, and, and I think this this brings us actually to a pretty good point, and that's that I think we both know people that are at that level. I mean, I know people who've won Academy Awards and, you know, reached the height of Hollywood fame. And the fact is, yes, they're actors, and they're very good at coming off as being humble or dumb or all the stereotypes that people want actors to be. But in reality they are machines and they have the ability to navigate in very difficult waters. They have the ability to navigate rooms with producers and make sure that they don't step on the wrong toes and that they do step on the right toes and that they're at the right place at the right time. And their business sense is sharp to the point where they know they need to get the best management. My point is this, that things are rarely what they seem, especially in Hollywood. And more so, the people who you see succeeding, people like Tom Cruise and all these you know, different people where you think, oh, it's just a good looking guy who can act and he got a lucky break. That's such bullshit. These people are sharp as a fucking tack and they know exactly what they're doing. Actors, actresses, I am yet to meet somebody who is at that level of success in Hollywood who doesn't have as much, if not more business sense than the, the high up business people that I know. Well, I think in comedians, it's a little bit different because the art of being on comedy is such a solo art. If they're great on stage, they may never have to execute all these business transactions. But if you think about it, acting is, is not an entrepreneur activity. When you get into producing, you're an entrepreneur. But that first five or 10 years, you're asking people to hire you, which means you have to basically be the best interviewer ever. And then when you're there, you got to be amazing to work with. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think I was ever the greatest actor, but I was so fun and easy to work with. People just kept hiring me back and ended up with, you know, 16, 17 movies, not because I'm brilliant or, but you know, like, Hey, I like that having around. He's easy to be with. He's always on time, like just dependable enough 
to get invited back. You know what I mean? So maybe if I'd have started at 20, it would have been a little different. Not that it was ever like the major passion, but it was just on my bucket list. I, I like that idea. And I, we never talked about it like this. I know it's a, it's a phrase you, you, that's been used with movies, but there are things on your bucket list that you can't really do until you handle like the basic needs, like the Maslow's yeah. needs and some money and your health and your family. I and mean, you can't move to LA and, you know, be a stand up comic if you've got to raise two kids and you're selling insurance every day. And I, and I'm really blessed that I was able to just knock off all these things in about 10 years. It was amazing. Yeah. And we talk about this too. You know, I think what you're getting to is foundational thinking and, you know, it's what, what we teach in our Amazon mastery course. I teach a course for you guys who are just tuning in, teaching people how to create predictable recurring revenue, start an Amazon company, find a product and start an Amazon business. And we teach people how to do that. By the way, I've got a one hour course. Anybody that's interested, it's normally 200 bucks. If you're listening to this podcast, you get it for free, no obligation. Reach out to us on the links below, fbasellercourse.com. And I'm happy to, to give that to anybody who wants to free of charge. But with that said, I think one of the things that we teach that's so important is that you have to have four pillars, four legs to any table. And one of those legs has to be something that brings you stability. You have to have stability. Eventually you want to get out of selling your hours, but it's okay to sell your hours for a period of time until you can get the other three pillars situated. So one thing's going to be your career, your job, whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter. You drive Uber, whatever it is, keeps diapers on the kid, food on the table. Second pillar cash flow positive real estate. And you and I have talked about this and I know that you're you're doing a deep dive now into cash flow positive real estate. And I love it every time I, I get you on uh, FaceTime, you're 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 right there in a property that you're remodeling and going to be turning into a cash cow, which is amazing, Bart. The third pillar is something which I know you do as well, compounded interest. The reason why Warren Buffett's one of the wealthiest men in the world, because he understands compound interest and he puts his money in things like the market. And the fourth one, which we talk about is starting an e-commerce business, Amazon, eBay, Etsy, Walmart, Poshmark, any of these e-commerce platforms that you can get involved in now and build that business that's bringing in recurring revenue for you. Now you've got a nice foundation for what you want to do. And I think this leads me to what we were talking about. So I think you had asked me before the show, like, what are some of the mistakes that people make? What's the biggest mistake that people make on Amazon? And I think this goes kind of to what you and I talk about often is one of the biggest mistakes that people make in life. Also, I think it's just going into something with some knowledge, thinking that you don't need to learn the fundamentals. Because it's like that old adage, you know, the one of the, the student who goes to the master and, he, and the master's pouring tea. And he goes, oh, master, will you teach me? And the master has the, the tea kettle and he pours the tea into his cup and the tea pours over and fills the table. And he goes, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, and he says, I can't teach you. And he says, why? Why can't you teach me? And he says, because your cup's already full. Come back when your cup's empty. And similarly with Amazon, people oftentimes come and they're like, dude, I have built the best mousetrap ever. It's going to be amazing to sell on Amazon. And I have to let them know, Bart, hey, man, like, that's not how it works. Nobody gives a fuck about your better mousetrap. Doesn't matter. I bet you there's 10 guys that have better mousetraps than you. Well, what do people care about then? They care about a better story. They care about better value. They care about better presentation. And then maybe they care about a better product. Maybe, but that's way down the line. Nobody's going on the Amazon platform looking for a better product. They know what they want. They know in general terms what they're looking for, price point, features, those types of things. And 
the thing that sways them are the elements of influence more than anything. So to answer your question, one of the most common mistakes I think that people make now on Amazon is going in to start an Amazon business, to start an Amazon FBA business selling on Amazon with a product already in mind. Now, that's not always something that is a showstopper because sometimes people guess right and they've got a good category and there's a demand for their product. But this is why when we teach, we teach people how to work backwards to find the market to find a niche within that market that they can dominate, find where your competition is weak, and then take them out at the knees. Have I been watching too many mafia movies this week? You're the only person I know that quotes, uh, is it Jin Sung Su, The Art of War? Like you, are, you have a particular philosophy where capitalism really isn't lovey-dovey. It's competitive and it's oh. real. And I love that. And and when we've sat down and talked about Amazon, of course, I've marketed all kinds of products in my life. It's always start from what are people buying? What do we want? Like you never ask me like, what are you good at? Or what are you thinking about? Like that didn't come out of your mouth. It comes out like, hey, what's where, where? I mean, yes, I'd rather sell motorcycle seats than tampons, of course, because I have some interest in that market and customer. If you're going to serve that market, maybe you should have some affinity. But you're always starting with the market in mind. And it reminds me of all the authors because, you know, I wrote a book at 23, so I've probably talked to 10,000 wannabe authors. And it's literally, and I've talked to my buddies that are agents, and it's all the same thing. They think their story is unique. They yeah. think their story of overcoming cancer anybody yeah. cares about. They think it, they, it's not unique. Nobody cares, and yet you can't tell them that because they're so invested in their story because they wrote the book first instead of said – what is interesting? What do people want? So I think it's not just Amazon. I think it's kind of all over life. People just start something because they think they're good at it rather than saying, whoa, look at this demand. People are coming out of their and coming out of the woodworks to buy this. Let me look at that. And I think that's what you're talking about is market first and then product. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right about my viewpoint about these things. I do think of it as a, a predatory marketplace. That's one of, one of my favorite lines for a film is, uh, you know, first, first prize, is you get five thousand dollars second prize is a set of kitchen knives and third prize is you're fucking fired from uh, glenn gary glenn ross <laughs> alec baldwin something like that i probably butchered the quote such a good but it's, movie, though. it's such a good movie and it's true it's true there's no fucking participation prize in the real world there's no participation prize on amazon you don't get an honorable mention for having good intentions so you have to go out there ready to crush. And if you can't handle that, get a fucking job. Go work for someone and sell or your Or go hours. be a socialist. There's plenty of countries that would love to have you as a socialist, you know. And I know there's there's a whole political movement of like, oh, everybody should be free and give the money away and feed the homeless. And you know what? Get three kids and start an Amazon business and see how socialist you are. You yeah. won't be that socialist once you have write your checks. <laughs> Go read Ayn Rand, <laughs> the, the yeah. founder, Atlas Shrugged, and let's see if your philosophy doesn't change a little bit. Yeah, and when has that ever worked? Look at look at the experiments in socialism and communism. Right, the definition of communism being that the means of production are in the hands of the state. When has that ever worked? Which state is that in? that is working right now people argue okay maybe like some of the um the, the region norway yeah like those those places they, they have some of the highest tax rates in the entire world and you do not have yes you have a good quality of life but it's not comparable to where we're, and it's fucking cold it's cold in those places unless you're a viking and are ready to let your balls shrink to the size of a peanut um you may not want to be there the entire year. Although I do like Vikings, another great TV series on strategy. If you want to learn strategy, watch Vikings, any of the seasons. It is absolutely fucking spectacular. Um, so you said one mistake uh, in, yeah, in the Amazon business. Again, this probably applies to all your businesses, and I'll chime in as, as they apply to some of the things I'm familiar with. And now I've, I've got some Amazon – I've got books, of course. I get royalties, yeah. and that goes back to the pillar. Like even – and it's funny. I have the conversation. So I'm doing two of those pillars, real estate and we've got like audio books, and, and, and I spent so many years doing internet, and I was telling my dad once, I said – I can buy another house, but you know what I'd rather do is mm. spend two months on this audiobook for this book I've released years ago 
but I'd be making a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month with no marketing. That's yeah. a heck of a lot more than the difference between the rent and the mortgage. He goes, you know what? That's interesting because that's an asset because he's old enough to not think that that's an asset. Mm. He thinks real estate's an asset. If you can't touch it and feel it, it's not an asset. But what I'm hearing you saying is it's 2021. Real, real estate is one great asset, but so is internet real estate being a website, domain, a yeah. book, an audio book, an Amazon store. That's real real estate. The only difference is Amazon can fire you. And, and um, you know, when real real estate, it's, you could get usurped by the government, but it's unlikely, you know what I mean, to yeah. just get it taken away. Yeah. It's, well, okay. So real estate, you've got less momentum. You have, you know, you're not going to buy a property today and tomorrow have it be worth 10 times as much. That's not likely the case. What more likely is that you buy a property it gets some appreciation. It gets a little depreciation as well. You get a little bit of cash flow. And over 10, 15, 20 years, you're building wealth. You're building cash flow. You're building income. And you use equity from that property to buy other properties. Now, we're, we're going to do a separate show on real estate. And I know you've got some great ideas and some hacks you want to share as well, as, as do I. And some interesting guests I think will be interesting to, to, to chime in because everybody yeah. thinks what their parents told them. Go to the bank, borrow money. Or, you know, go buy a used, a used car. Like, there's just not a lot of option A, B, and then C, D, E, F, G. There's a lot of ways to get there. In all three of these areas, we're talking about, you know, a little bit of real estate. A little bit, but let's get back to the internet and specifically Amazon because that's probably the lowest hanging fruit. You don't yeah. have to spend $30,000 on a bunch of stuff from China to get started. You right. can test it, right, for a few hundred. Then if it all wins, I mean, how, how does that look as far as, as people move up into the real business and the real numbers? Sometimes. If you don't have at least, I would say, between two to $5,000, you should still be fucking driving Uber. You need to figure out how to get between five to 10 grand in your bank that is disposable income that you're okay parting with in an attempt to achieve wealth and fortune and all those things that you want. It's, it's, it's a modest amount of money compared to other businesses. You want to start a restaurant, you're going to need hundreds of thousands. A dry cleaners, hundreds of thousands. A coin laundry, you're going to need 100,000 or more in most uh, populated or populous states. Let's talk about the first second because I just started a documentary on yeah. uh, Amazon Prime called Lulu something, Lulu Lulu. Prime, Lulu King. Anyway, it's about this company that's a huge MLM clothing company. Yeah. And um, the name will come to me, but I'm sure every female listener knows what it is. It's basically starting 2013. But the narrators, the documentary, you can't tell if you're going, they're going to slam them or they're going to you know, extol them right. as, as heroes. Yeah. It's very well filmed because I don't think that most people going in to start an MLM company go in with the idea that we're going to get sued by the FDA and get sued by the, and we're going to scam people. They go in with the idea that we've got a little product we love, but we can sell hope. And so the reason you mentioned that is, yeah, you can own your own store with inventory, but you own it hundred percent. If you become a distributor for $5,000 to some Amway or, or Herbalife, you have a bunch of stuff that you didn't have before in your garage. But you just don't know if that's going to sell, if it's your thing, it's at your bag. All of a sudden, you're front-loaded these products, and I have found more people than not can't sell those things. And you're not really buying a business. You're buying permission to be a salesperson, so you're literally yeah. paying money to have a job. So tread lightly on those business opportunities, but when you're putting your own money in your own brand, now you're a real business owner. And yours is kind of in the middle. You know, You don't have to rent – um, a dry cleaner anymore. You don't have to put two year lease. You don't have to put 38, 80, what, 100, $600,000 for McDonald's? Like, you don't have yeah, to right. do that. The business model's changed so much in the last 10 years. Yeah. Look, I think there's a lot of people that like MLMs, and there's a lot of, and those are usually the people that have large social networks that they can tap into for that kind of stuff. So, if you're a member of a super church, if you're, member of, you know, some like big club and you can exploit that to make money, you could do that. Now, here's the thing I never understood. And I am an expert at the production of supplements and how supplements work in this country in particular, where you buy them, how you make them, how you introduce them. You can make a supplement or a cosmetic. You can make a hundred bottles now. There's companies that sell that. Why wouldn't you, if you had that network, Make your own supplement and make 100% of the profits. 
okay, well, maybe you don't have the wherewithal to do the branding, the packaging, and maybe you don't have the confidence to sell your own product. But that always shocked me because I was like, well, all right, so now you're going to go buy $1,000 worth of product from distributor A in this MLM. And for those of you guys who don't know, it's multi-level marketing. Effectively, and I hope I'm not offending anybody who's involved in multi-level marketing, but a lot of people do believe that it is very similar to a Ponzi scheme because the people at the top of the pyramid make money every time a product is sold down the line. So you're at the top of the line, you're whatever, their top sales guy. You have to bring in a certain number of other salespeople under you. And these could be your cousin, your uncle, Joe, your aunt Susie. And then they bring people in under them. And so you make money all the way at the top. And all these people are required to sell and buy a bunch of products from you and from everybody up the line. And that's how it works. It's kind of like this trickle up economics. The unfortunate fact about it is, is that it really does work like a Ponzi scheme. And the people who tend to profit from this are the people at the higher levels of the echelons. Down the line, and, and the multi-level marketing companies, and I'm not calling anyone out in particular, will argue with this till the end of time. <laughs> but the fact is there are more people with boxes of shit under their bed that's expired, that they weren't able to sell, that they gave up on, that it seemed like a great idea when they were in the room, and then now they're sitting in it. And it's that money going to the top that has created that wealth. It's not the fact that they have any amazing product that you can't get anywhere else. I am yet to see a multi-level company that has a product that you can't just buy on Amazon for a fraction of the price and does everything, if not more, and is backed by a great company and a return policy. Yet to find one. They just tell a better story. And they do it through the influence of peer pressure, social pressure, authority, likability, all those things. Maybe it's social proof, all the Robert Cialdini stuff. Uh, and it's interesting because you, you were saying that the secret to selling at Amazon is telling a better story. And yet we're just sitting here talking about how do you create a billion dollar MLM? Tell a better story. Don't just have a good product. Have a decent product and have a better story. Now you've got a movement. I love it. Every year I get one or two companies coming to me wanting me to develop products for them, wanting me to get involved. Not, not as a salesperson, but more along the lines of, hey, can you make us a product line or whatever? And I've always shied away from MLMs because I don't like that concept of the little guy getting shafted. When you create your own product, anybody can create a supplement. And we teach this again in the Amazon Mastery course. So reach out to us and I'll send you guys that course for free. We teach people how you can contact manufacturers now and get 100 bottles of something made. It's very common. There's even a company we talked to the other day that'll make you 50 bottles of something. And put your label on it. To put your label on it and, and sell it. Now, the challenge with supplements is this. It is highly competitive. As the barriers to entry in the marketplace have been dramatically reduced, everybody has a supplement. So if you have a supplement, you have to be able to differentiate yourself. You have to be able to tell a better story, do better marketing, find a better niche. Now, one supplement, like let's say vitamin C, might be great to sell to people for general immunity support. However, there might be a million people competing for that piece of the pie because it's so big. And the biggest guy on Amazon might be doing 50 million bucks a month selling immunity support vitamin C because he's number one. But you might be able to take that same vitamin C and sell it for skin support. Exact same product, different label, different story. Now there's fewer people looking for vitamin C for skin support. You just got a big piece of a small pie. And that's how you make money. That's the smart way to make money as far as supplements go. But supplements, very easy to manufacture. Cosmetics, very easy to manufacture. You can call up a company today and get a product tomorrow. You're talking hundreds of dollars to develop a product, not thousands of dollars. And a lot of manufacturers don't even charge for formulation or they'll charge a, a, a nominal charge of like a couple hundred bucks. So you could have your very own supplement that does whatever you want it to do in a fairly short amount of time. 
So I invite anybody actually who, before you consider getting involved in an, in an MLM, reach out to us. I'll show you how to make the product yourself because what they're going to have you do is go to your coworkers and friends and family and sell their crap, their third rate crap. Why don't you make some first rate crap yourself, label it, market it, and package it, sell it to your friends, coworkers, whatever. You don't have to have any people down the line from you. You don't have to have your uncle selling for you and you make all the money. And then you're building a, a solid recurring revenue stream because hopefully you're going to be selling them something that's not just a one-time thing. And you'll be able to now also sell that on the Amazon platform. You'll be able to sell it on Walmart, on eBay, on all these other platforms. And you create a viable business, a real business that's bringing value to people, that's giving a product that people need at a price that they're agreeable to. And you do that, and then you start improving your products and expanding your lines. And that's how ultimately you end up becoming successful in e-commerce. It's not get rich quick part, but it's definitely get rich slow and steady. But you will own your brand. I mean, that has yeah. an exit possibility. People can come and buy that store, buy that brand, buy our inventory, and you can go do something completely different, or you could cash out. What do you think years. it costs to register a trademark these days? What do you think? I'm going to guess 25 grand. It is between 400 and $700, including attorney's fees. 700 bucks, trademark, not just, not, not a copyright. That's cheaper. Trademark, patent, Trade. is that higher? Patent is a little bit more expensive depending on how complex the patent is. There are two different kinds of patents. I'm not an expert at this, although I have several patents. The way that it works is there's a design patent that's a patent for how something looks. If something's design is, is its functionality or it's just a design thing, like for example, if you want a fly swatter that's shaped like a diamond, you can patent that diamond shape. Now, there's also a, what's known as a utility patent, and that is exactly what it sounds like. It's for the function of killing a fly with a, a wand. And for that, it will be much more difficult. And sometimes it comes out to like a little mini lawsuit with the patent office to litigate your case for them to give you the broadest claims on that patent. So you make a number of claims with your patent saying, okay, my fly swatter is diamond shape. It's got an electrical mesh on it and it's only powered by nine volt batteries. Well, okay, they'll give that to you because Nobody else wanted to claim something like that. Nobody else has something like that. If you get more specific and you say, well, I, or, or more broad and say, I just want an electric um, wand uh, that kills flies, they say, well, there's a lot of electric wands that kill flies. Your idea is not unique, so we will not give that to you. And then you argue those points until the claims come to a place where the examiner is, is happy with it. So, so a patent could cost anywhere from a couple thousand bucks from the time you start to the time you finish to, you know, 40, 50,000 bucks if it's a very complex one. But in general, five, 10 grand, you should be able to get something with a good attorney. And if anybody needs a good attorney, I've got a great one. So feel free to reach out to me and um, if I can direct you to a, a good patent or trademark attorney. But this is actually interesting. It's probably the second mistake that people make, Bart. And that's that Nobody is crazy enough to steal your fucking idea. Put that out of your mind. I was selling herbal ecstasy for four years, five years before we started getting knockoffs. And the knockoffs were like few and far in between. And they were like, you know, Chinese mafia like characters that had a few of them. It wasn't my manufacturers that, was, that were copying me. It wasn't like real competitors. It was like weird, like, it was some weird like thing that there was nothing I could have done. And they are, are you were, saying that the takeaway to this advice is get started now and don't worry about yeah. being fearful? Is, is that the takeaway? Yeah. Yeah, Cause it may happen. I mean, it might, but the odds of it happening are lower than you think, right? Nobody is crazy enough to steal your fucking idea. Really, truly. If you're sitting right now on a great idea and you really think it's a gold mine, I want you to go outside, find a random stranger and ask them to kick you in the ass because that is a bad idea. Don't actually do that and then complain to me. Maybe ask a family member to kick you in the ass. That's probably better because you are fucking procrastinating. Get out there, 
and sell your shit. Everything starts with one sale. And this is what I tell people all the time. The first step for you is to sell one of your thing. If you have a product and you want to sell in brick and mortar and you're not sure if it's going to sell, before you spend that money, check, make sure your balls are still attached and walk into a store and talk to the buyer and say, I've got this great product. I'll be out. I'll be out with it in the next year, six months, whatever. This is what it does. These are the features. Would you order this? And they will listen to you and they will tell you, yes, we would. No, we wouldn't. No, you got to talk to this other person. Then you talk to the other person. You say, would you order this? They say, oh yeah, absolutely. We love selling thingamajigs. You say, great. How many would you order? Oh, we would probably at least order a couple dozen. Fantastic. Can I get you down for an order of a couple thousand? Then you go make it. What a great way. I've done that numerous times. And then you can cross sell into different channels and marketplaces. It's a great way to do things. That's what Nolan out. Bushnell did for his first Atari game with Radio Shack. He, he literally came in with a barely functional working model and got an order for three or 400,000. And he didn't know he could manufacture that many. He had no idea. But he said, we just got an order for $300,000 by Christmas. We'll make it happen. And that's how the video game was invented. He pre-sold it without a completely functioning working thing. Nolan is such Crazy. a legend. It's funny, as you're saying that, I'm staring at him. because he, right? he is right there on the back of my book. He's um, a living finally. legend in business. It's so great to be able to chat with him and hear his stories. He's such a neat guy. But that's what he did. And so you're saying it's not that it patents and all those things aren't useful, but people use them as excuses. You're saying go sell it. Don't worry about the Chinese. Don't worry about who's knocking you off. See if there's a market there because you're gonna, if you have money in your pocket, you can go then handle those legal things if you need to. Yeah, man, you're not fucking one of these mega companies. Like nobody cares. Eventually down the line, get a patent, get a trademark, get the copyrights, do all that stuff. Great. But right now your job is to sell. Why even spend $400 or $700 on getting a trademark when you can use that money to buy ads to sell your product, when you could use that money to run promotions to get your product ranked on Amazon, also what we teach. Now, there is a reason why you would want a trademark, and that's to get the Amazon brand registry. That's the enhanced brand content, what's known as A-plus content in the Amazon description. To do that, you really need to use an Amazon attorney, and that costs somewhere between 700 and 1000 bucks. And you could do that at any time as you get going. If that's important to you to have that, and it's not a bad idea if you're starting an Amazon business, and we show you how to do it. And... If you have the budget for it, do it, but don't worry about people stealing your idea. If they're going to do it, they're going to steal it anyway. But usually people don't steal your idea. The reason why ideas fail isn't because somebody stole their idea. The reason why ideas fail is because the, the founders never get started with them. They have perfection paralysis. They, they worry about all these details and they never get it going. There's, there's one guy I know. And I love him to death, but he is constantly getting in his own way. And every time I ask him about his business and how his business is going, he's got like 50 objections. And I'm like, dude, just fucking do it. Oh, but this and that, and I got to register here and do this and get this license and that license. And I'm just like, bro, go sell one. You don't need anything. Just go sell one. He doesn't think like that. So he's constantly getting in his own way. And so many people are like that, men and women alike. They constantly get in their own way. Let that shit go. Just go out there, find the thing you want to do and fucking do it. There's really, when you simplify things, and this is actually probably a great topic for us to discuss on, on a future show, is simplicity and minimalism. When it comes down to it, there is an essential simplification in any movement that gets you to that end result very quickly. It is an efficiency that comes from determination and wanting to do something, to put out that minimum viable product. People so often lack 
confidence. You know this from coaching people with your Prism program that I saw that looks like it's going gangbusters now. You get no, it's it's really fun, and we're in like our sixth week. But it's so interesting because as you're talking, because I've been talking to people one on one and in a group, and they have all these excuses. I've got to finish one more year of grad school. I've got to wait till my kids are certain grown. They've got all these excuses before they jump into anything. They're not even talking about a particular career, but it does feel like people get stuck with their limitations. I got to finish this registration. I need permission. I need a business license first. You don't they need a business license at all. Your business might fail. Just go out and do it. And then if you get a letter from the state, pay the fine. <laughs> I mean, it's silly yeah. to go out and start 18 businesses not knowing, pay the state first before you make a profit. That's crazy. Ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Yeah. In general, I think that makes sense. Look, you want to be smart, as smart as you can about things, but you have to go. There's, there's two kinds of people in the world. And I think this is one of the things that we talk about often that I think is very interesting. And it's that I really feel that there's, there's, there's truly two types of people. There are what we call broad strokes people. Most of the high level millionaires, billionaires, people that are uber successful in the world that I know are broad strokes people. Yeah, let's start a shoe company, go out there, athletic shoes that make you bounce five times higher, do it. And they bring on all the people to handle all the specialized little detail stuff. And if you ask them about the details, how's the sole made and is it made with a three, six stitch or a five, they, they wouldn't know that. And then there's detail-oriented people. These are the people that think about every little detail. Is it a 3-6 stitch or a 5-16? Is it a this or a that? Now, there is crossover, but to execute, to get something done in a reasonable fucking amount of time, where you can reproduce and scale, it is not the artist's fucking way. This is the way that shit gets done in the world of business. This is the Steve Jobs way that things get done is that you have to focus on the minimum viable product and then fix it on the fly. It's the only way. Steve Jobs didn't come out with the perfect fucking phone shining on all ends, bulletproof with no buttons. He had a vision for coming out with a phone with no buttons, with this glass, with these features. And he came out with it as quickly as he could, first to market advantage, and then fixed it as he fucking went along. Ooh, version 13 now, got better and better. Get better and better. And now it's pretty decent, still not perfect. There's, he's so, working on it from the grave right now. Let me, let me get you back on topic. You had two big mistakes, and they also had these four pillars, which I think we've covered. And of course, if you listen to the show, we always talk about those four pillars of wealth. Uh, but what are the other two? Did, did you think of anything besides just not starting, uh, not checking the market first, and then also um, what was the, th the third one I think you're about to tell us? Oh, the four pillars of wealth. Yeah. So the first one's your career, what's bringing in regular money. The second pillar is going to be uh, cash flow positive real estate. The third is something that's giving you compound interest. And the fourth is going to be your e commerce business, the Amazon store that you are going to stop what you are doing right now. Go to fbasellercourse.com, reach out to me. I will send you a free course. That means zero. You pay nothing. Take the free course and start an Amazon business. Never talk to me again. Great. If you talk to me again, that'd be great too. If you want to dig deeper, I'm happy to help you with that. But if you don't want to, don't. But take this and start a business and just drop me an email after you're making your first $5,000, $10,000 of extra revenue a month, $20,000 extra revenue a month, and just say, thanks, Shaheen, you were right. Um, you mentioned that there's some big mistakes people make in starting an Amazon business. I know you probably have a hundred of them because you've got students and you've got so many real clients. What are the other kind of the top four that you think? Is it the lack of telling a great story? Is it a lack of good product? Is it a lack of sourcing from China? Is it the fact they don't know what reviews are? Like what's the biggest flag that they just don't get? So the first mistake we talked about is not thinking distribution first, having a product and then going out there to, to find a, a hole to plug. You don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be the guy with the hole plug going out there and finding a hole to plug. You want to find a hole and then come out there and plug it. Somehow that sounds perverse, but I think you know what I mean. 
I've heard better metaphors, but I feel like <laughs> apparently you find the thing that already exists and supply the solution. Okay, whatever. You want to keep it PG? We could do that. I think. <laughs> How did I become the, the appropriate one in life? That's never happened. <laughs> there we go. I think the second area of mistakes that people make, like we said, is self doubt. And self doubt, I think, stems more times than not from perfection paralysis. Perfection paralysis is an insecurity. That is a, I am afraid of success. I heard you talk about this in your PRISM program, your success program, which I think you should tell people what it is and what it's about and how they could check it out. But success breeds fear in those whose hearts are weak. What that means is a lot of people, and if you dig deep, you find out that a lot of people are not afraid of failure, but afraid of success. What will happen if they actually succeed? What will people think of them? Will they be held to that bar from now on? There's so many factors. So people pick up perfection. They go, oh yeah, I'm a perfectionist. So I couldn't possibly have the shoes out without a soul that does wig and McGee, you know, whatever. And that thingamajig, that the soul does on the shoe isn't available for a year. That's no problem. I'm going to wait a year. The guy who's successful goes, I don't fucking care if you got to cut up a tire and throw it at the bottom of that goddamn thing. Get me a fucking shoe and we'll figure out how to make the soul thing a majiggy later. And that's what happens. That's what happens. So I think that's, that's probably going to be the second fundamental mistake that people make when they start an Amazon business. The third one is going into it unprepared. And that means also going into it when you're not stable. If you don't have stability in your life, if you don't have some level of disposable income that you could comfortably burn, never see again, and just start over and try the same thing again in a slightly different way and succeed, your chances of success are greatly diminished. I think those are, those are three big fundamental mistakes that people make as far as starting an Amazon business. And the fourth one, and I think this would be the final one that, that you and I talked about early on in this, is not being in the position to do that, not wanting to take that entrepreneurial journey. And that's okay. Entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. Capitalism isn't for everybody. You can go get a fucking job, get a paycheck, and you'll be guaranteed to get that paycheck until they stop giving it to you. And you show up, you clock in, you clock out, and that's your life. Maybe you get some benefits, maybe you don't. One day they'll fire you, go work somewhere else doing the same kind of thing, and go sit with your friends and complain about how shitty the world is, and look at Jeff Bezos and how he's wasting his money flying to the moon and, and all that stuff. Or you can have some courage and go out there. And there's nothing wrong with being a working class person. There's nothing wrong with having a job and, and working and having a family and surviving. I get that. I think for some of us, and hopefully if you're watching this, that's you, you have a higher vision of yourself. You know that there is a great amount of potential within you that is untapped. And in order to get to that point, you eventually are going to have to quit that fucking job and stop selling your hours for money. And there is a path out there to freedom. There is. There is a path out there to success. I came from less than nothing. I came from negative money, owing money to some third-rate mob guy, sleeping in the back of a Lincoln Continental with a flashlight, eating ketchup and relish until I fucking made it. I didn't speak English my first seven years in this country, and I fucking made it. My dad worked at a pizza shop and a dry cleaners. We sometimes didn't have you know, all the food that we wanted, all the clothes that we wanted, all the stuff that we wanted, and I fucking made it. I could have settled for less. And this is my hope for all you people who are watching Hack and Grow Rich, who are watching this show, who are consuming this content, who buy my book, Billion, who check out Bart's course, his PRISM program, that you learn 
and that you set higher expectations for yourself where eventually, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point you stop selling your hours for money. And I believe that the path to that is nuanced. It involves those four pillars that we talked about, cash flow, real estate, compounded interest, having a career, and an e-commerce business. And the quickest way, the best way I could hand you that e-commerce business that you could start today, tonight, as you are listening or watching us, make sure to like and subscribe, by the way, is by starting an Amazon business. There will be more millionaires made around Jeff Bezos than any other company. And he's not an MLM and he can help you get rich. <laughs> he really gave a great opportunity for people. I mean, you know, in 1955, the only way you can reach a consumer is newspaper or TV advertising. So it makes sense to, 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 to find all kinds of other ways like franchising. And now it's one click away. Um, you mentioned the Life Design by Prism course. I would love to invitation for you guys to check it out. We may have one starting up in the next month or so. But if you'd like a breakthrough, if you'd like to have that psychological retuning, sort of your values, belief systems, and then a bunch of daily habits, which will set you off to having kind of thinking like a CEO, uh, but it's in your personal life. Uh, so just you can Google Life Design by Bart Baggett. You'll scroll down about four or five links. You'll see Prism Life Design. The actual website starts with a P, Prism, P-R-I-S-M, like the uh, triangle, lifedesign.com. But it's something special. I mean, we are not big new age, uh, we're business guys, but we I took all the personal development that I've learned over the last 30 years and mixed it with like the perspective of a, of a CEO or a business dashboard and blended this so that you could actually manage your own life, create some successful habits. And then whatever you do, whatever goal setting you do in the months after that, you just be much more efficient because you're happier and you're on, you're in alignment. I think we talked about aligning with things that your highest power is. So thanks for the uh, interesting uh, program tonight. I always learn something from you and you always get me excited. And I, and I felt like you scolded people a little bit tonight in a good way. Like you're the bat, you're the mean father tonight saying, get off your arse. That's the Australian word for arse. Get off your arse and, and do that thing. Yeah. Well, let's not fuck around. If you're listening to this podcast, it's called Hack and Grow Rich. We're not here to sell you shit. We're not here to fucking, you know, diddle around, diddle doodle around. We are here to empower you to make money, to actually fucking get rich. And you're not going to be doing it selling your hours to that asshole. You're just not. So walk into your job tomorrow, look your boss in the eye and say, fuck you, I quit. I'm starting an Amazon business. Okay, maybe don't do that until you have enough money to pay the bills. <laughs> It'll feel good though, knowing that one day you're going to do that. One day you're going to walk in to the office. You're going to look at your boss. Just like I tell the story in my book, Billion, how I used to sleep behind a copy machine and the boss was this curmudgeonly old guy and he would beat me with a cane and kick me out of the store, didn't pay me my wages, <laughs> only to find me one day pulling up to a, the fanciest restaurant in LA with the most beautiful girl by my side in a brand new red Ferrari. And you can only imagine the look on his face. And I, I, I tell that story in my book. Maybe I'll tell it on the next episode of Hack and Grow Rich, but go for it. We believe in you. You're one of our audience, so you must be fucking awesome. Don't and the worst that can happen is you fail and you get up and you do it again. It's not the end of the world. It's, it's just life. You know, it's funny, Bart. I was having a conversation in a group that we're both members of, and we were talking about COVID. And I think somebody brought up a topic of like, what's the worst that could happen? And somebody else said, well, you could die. And, and one gentleman uh, jumped in uh, very uh, studiously. He said, no, that is not the worst that could happen. The worst that could happen is that you could suffer. And wouldn't you, don't you want to die peacefully in your sleep? I think we all do. And I thought for a second about that, why that rubbed me so the wrong way, Bart. And I looked at him and I said, fuck no. He said, what? And I said, yeah, I don't want to fucking die in my sleep. I want to die with my boots on, my sword fucking drawn, like the Vikings yelling Valhalla. <laughs> you know, that's what the Vikings believed. The only way to Valhalla, their version of, of heaven, the great hall where Odin and all the gods would meet you, was if you got there through battle with your sword drawn. 
And that's so much of the spirit that's missing from today's political correctness, woke culture, and from all these this this new weaker society i feel that we built is that people forget that that's what our spirit is that's what the spirit of entrepreneurship is that's what the spirit of winning is it's not wanting to fucking die peacefully in your sleep that's for pussies that's bullshit <laughs> you don't want to fucking die peacefully in your sleep if you do you are in the wrong go get a fucking job go get a fucking job and work at that job if you want to be a warrior if you have that heart men, women, it doesn't matter, they's, thems, all of that. You want to die with your boots on and your fucking sword drawn. And that's probably a good way for us to end it. Oh, man, this has been Hack and Go Rich. My name is Bart Baggett. Shaheen Cheyenne is your co-host. Please hit the subscribe button, the like button, share this with your friends if they need a little, little kick in the arse to get them motivated. And we will see you next week on the show. All right, Bart, we're going to include the link to your books and how to get you on Instagram if they were interested in Prism down here. Guys, if you enjoyed the show, if anything we said resonated with you, it's a little bit of tough love tonight, but I feel that people need this now more than ever. So Bart and I are giving you a little bit of tough love. Me a little bit more than Bart. He's nicer than me sometimes. Check out my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult, and make sure to like and subscribe us and share the show with anybody who you think needs a kick in the arse. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.